if you were trapped in a mansion during a hurricane and someone was killing your friends one by one, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the killer in Bodies Bodies Bodies. These girls will commit cold-blooded murder just to survive. Sophie here has decided to visit her childhood friends for a long overdue reunion and arrive at this huge mansion, but her girlfriend B is nervous. She's never met them before, and wanting to make a good impression, the girl returns to the vehicle to pick up a present she brought for everyone. Before leaving, she checks her appearance in the mirror, but forgets to close the sun visor as she leaves the car, and this one mistake will get them all killed. Meanwhile, Sophie finds her friends hanging out in the swimming pool, and they're all excited to see her after such a long time. That's when B arrives, and her girlfriend runs over, introducing her childhood friends. Getting out of the water, the group starts planning for their hurricane party, when Greg here approaches with a champagne bottle and cuts the top open with a sword. It's impressive, and the man pours a drink for everyone, but Sophie here declines. She's trying to stay sober, and the friends make a toast, but they're suddenly interrupted by the rain. The hurricane is already on its way, and the group heads indoors, passing the time by catching up with each other, but have no idea this reunion will become a massacre. That night, they're all partying as hard as they can, when Jordan here approaches B, asking where she went to university. The girl tells her she went to Utah State, with no idea that this information will be used against her. Meanwhile, Sophie checks in with the host, warning him not to drink so much, but the man ignores her, insisting she should keep an eye on her partner instead. Looking around, she spots one of their friends dancing too closely with her girlfriend, and that's when she decides to interrupt the music, suggesting that they all play a game of bodies, bodies, bodies. Explaining the rules, Sophie tells them that they will each get a piece of paper, and whoever takes the one with an X becomes the secret murderer. Then, they'll turn off all the lights and hide as the killer hunts them down, but if someone discovers a body, they must announce it immediately and vote on who the murderer is. With that, the group starts turning off the lights, and B here looks for a place to hide, with no idea that this is going to turn into a real-life killing spree. The game begins, and B sneaks around, trying to hide from the other players, when suddenly, the girl hears someone shouting. They've discovered a dead body, and she goes upstairs, joining the group, to find Greg lying motionless on the floor. Thinking nothing of it, the survivors begin their first round of voting, and the host accuses his girlfriend of being the murderer. He reminds everyone that she always stays quiet until there's an opportunity to gang up on somebody and vote them out. It's her go-to strategy to beat the game, and this girl accuses the host of being the murderer, but is interrupted when B realizes the victim isn't moving. Okay, this is not going to end well. It might not look like much, but if we're paying attention, it's already clear these people are one argument away from killing each other. First of all, there's Jordan here who's jealous of Sophie's new girlfriend and wants to put the girl in her place. Then there's David here who clearly hates Greg and has already punched the man in the face during one of their drinking games. He's also high as a kite, and when you take a tense situation like this, throw in a sharp weapon and play a murder game in the dark, it's a recipe for violence. They've already admitted that every time they play this game, it gets ugly, so we have good reason to think that these people will try to get revenge on each other. Now, B here wants to impress these people, and we don't want to become their enemy, but there's actually something we can use to our advantage. The natural instinct here is to stay out of their drama, but the truth is, we're stuck in a mansion with a bunch of wealthy addicts in the middle of a hurricane. It's inevitable that we're going to get roped in whether we like it or not, and that's why if it were me, I would stir the pot as much as possible. Since everyone has their own vendetta, they will all want the new girl to validate their perspective, and this is exactly what we want. The first thing I would do is try to find out why David here has a black eye, because there's no question it's the source of an ugly conflict. As the newcomer to the group, everyone will know that I'm asking innocent questions, and each person will want to convince me of their own story. As counterintuitive as it might seem, this puts us in a great position, because these people are clearly entertained by their own drama, and giving them a reason to talk about it will make them like us. This is important to our survival, because if the game escalates into violence, we're going to be a lot safer than the others if they believe we're on their side. As soon as this happens, the power dynamic changes, and the group is going to value our opinions more than anyone else's. All we need to do is continue investigating their drama from a place of innocence, and we won't be forced to choose sides. Worried, Alice here rolls the man over, but he still isn't moving. The group starts to panic, but that's when the host calms them down with a gentle sack tap, jolting him awake. Relieved, they continue playing, and Jordan suggests that the host might be the killer, but his girlfriend starts to defend him. They get into a heated argument on who the murderer is, and that's when Greg points out that the best defense is a good offense. It's a strange comp, and the players tell him it's against the rules for the dead to talk, but David here takes it personally. Confronting him, the host makes it clear that he doesn't like him, and the men get into a stare down, but Greg decides to call it a night, suggesting they play without him. After he leaves, the host accuses his girlfriend of being the killer, because she can't stop swallowing, and explains that it's her nervous tick. Defending herself, the two of them get into an argument, when their friend Alice interrupts. She jokes that this is why they never get intimate anymore, 
and the man realizes that his girlfriend has been talking about him behind his back. The girl accuses him of constantly gaslighting her, and he lashes out, insisting she's always playing the victim. The tensions start rising as the others join in, voting that David is the killer, and the man angrily smashes his bottle before storming out of the room. With that, the partygoers start taking shots, and decide to continue the game when lightning strikes, knocking out the power in the building. The girls think that David is messing with them, but they suddenly realize there's no Wi-Fi or service. Something's wrong, and Jordan decides to flip the breaker switch as everyone splits up. B heads downstairs, but as she's looking around for the bathroom, something bumps into the glass door behind her. Turning around, she realizes it's David, and his neck has been sliced open. The man drops to the ground just as the others find him, and quickly rush over to check on their friend, terrified that he's going to die. They have no idea how to help him, and the storm is getting stronger by the second. To make things worse, they can't get reception on their phones, and the girls panic, knowing that their only option left is to drive away into the hurricane. It's impossible to save this man's life in time, and that makes one person down with six more to go. Leaving the house, the survivors rush through the rain and quickly get into the vehicle, but when one of the girls tries the ignition, they quickly realize that the car won't start. The battery died after B left the sun visor down all night, and she asks them if there are any other cars around. The girls explain their friend Max dropped them off and left, but he isn't coming back until tomorrow, meaning they're trapped here in a hurricane with a killer on the loose. Okay, this escalated quickly. Being stuck in a pitch dark mansion is already scary enough, but when you add a killer to the situation, it's clear we need to start strategizing for survival. The car is dead and we can't call for help, but what's even more terrifying is that with so much bad blood between this group, the killer could be any one of them. It won't be long before they start blaming each other, so we need to make sure they don't start pointing the finger at us next. Now, our first instinct here is to panic, but if we can keep a level head, there are some key details that could save our lives. If we remember earlier when everyone ran inside, David here dropped his sword by the side of the pool, and it looks like that's the exact spot where he was murdered. This likely means his killer had to go outside in order to get the sword, but more importantly, it also means whoever the killer is must already be wet from the rain. With this in mind, the smartest thing for us to do right now is stay inside as dry as possible, because it's the only proof that we didn't murder him. The girls ran outside without realizing they were incriminating themselves, because this is exactly what the murder would do. Running towards the body will make them all wet and bloody, giving them an alibi for their appearance, and it means we won't be able to tell the killer apart from the others. If our clothes are dry, we can explain that it's impossible for us to be the murderer because the man was killed outside, and it gives us the strongest alibi of anyone in the group. I would then point out that David was still alive when we found him, which means the first person to run outside was probably the killer, because they'd be the closest to the crime when it happened. This would make Sophie here the prime suspect, but the girl is clearly dry, so it can't be her. What's suspicious is that the second person to come running was Emma, the man's girlfriend, and she comes darting out of the house less than a second after Sophie. From this angle, it would be impossible to figure out if her clothes were already wet and bloody, and it means this could have been her strategy from the beginning. Earlier during the game, Emma's boyfriend was bullying her, and it made the girl cry in front of everyone. What he said was straight up vicious, so it's definitely the best motive for murder among anyone in the group. The most damning evidence here is that nobody screamed his name or made a sound that would have drawn the girl's attention. There was no reason for Emma to know what was going on unless she was already there to witness what was happening, and this is why she should be considered suspect number one. Now, the last thing to point out is that if none of them are the killer, they clearly shouldn't stay inside the house. The car is out of battery, but most of a hurricane's deadly hazards come from floods, storm surges, and rip currents. Luckily, this mansion is nowhere near a coastline and is actually at a pretty high elevation, so all the girls need to worry about are strong winds and rain. Given the choice between locking themselves in with a murderer or being wet for a few hours, the choice should be a no-brainer. In this case, the best decision would be to put on rain jackets, climb the gate, and walk to a neighbor's house hoping to find Wi-Fi or a cell phone signal. Going back to the house, the group waits for the hurricane to pass, when they suddenly hear someone knocking on the door. The survivors back away, terrified it's the killer, but when a voice calls out, they realize it's their friend, Jordan. Relieved, Sophie opens the door, and they're shocked to see her holding a sword stained with blood. The group goes downstairs to discuss what they should do, and the girlfriend reminds them that the security system should still work even when the power is off. No one can get in without the code, but Alice points out their missing friend Max already knows what it is. He could be the killer after what he did last night, but that's when this girl tells her to keep quiet. Curious, Sophie asks what happened and her friend explains that Max confessed his feelings for the dead man's girlfriend. That could be a motive for murder, but Jordan here points out they haven't seen Greg since he left the game. He might also be the killer, and scared for her life, she reaches into a drawer to grab a meat cleaver. That makes the group nervous, and Alice demands she put down the weapon
husband, but Jordan refuses, asking how long she's known her boyfriend. Reluctantly, Alice admits that she's only met him recently and barely knows anything about him. It's clear that he's the most suspicious person here, and the girl calls him to come downstairs, hoping he'll be able to explain himself. Jordan quickly covers her mouth and tells her friend to stay quiet, but suddenly realizes that one of the other girls has just disappeared. They head upstairs to Alice's room looking for Greg, but the man is nowhere to be found. One of the girls asks Sophie if there are any guns in the house, but she tells her there aren't any, forcing the survivors to defend themselves with whatever else they can find. The group looks around the room for clues when Jordan suddenly finds Greg's luggage, but when they open it up, they discover it's full of survival gear, including a map that's circling the house that they're in. The girls are certain this man is the killer and continue looking for their friend before he gets to her next. Inside another room, they search for any signs of the missing girl when the group notices a body under the blankets. Lifting the covers, they find their friend hiding underneath and she gets up asking them why they followed her here. The girls explain they have proof the killer is Greg and they're trying to find him before he kills anyone else. With the plan set, they head downstairs to continue their search and find the older man sleeping on the floor of the indoor basketball court. It's strange and soon another person is about to be murdered. Okay, walking up to this guy was a huge mistake. Greg here is a giant compared to these girls, and everyone thinks he's a military veteran, while the only fighting experience they have is their losing battle with alcoholism. Most of the girls are already intoxicated, so even with kitchen knives, this is not the kind of guy you want to pick a fight with unless you have a very good plan. Now, if the girls think Greg is the killer, they have to realize that he's already planned for everything. So far, the murderer has cut the lights, jammed their phone signals, and brought a go bag to make his escape. This guy has superior tactical knowledge, and that means if he finds him lying on the floor of a basketball court, then this must be a part of his plan. If their theory was correct, then the whole situation looks like a trap, and that's why instead of trying to kill him, we need to trap him ourselves. If they were me, I would instruct one girl to keep watch at the window while the other four search for anything to barricade his only exit and lock him inside. This gives us a makeshift prison to keep the man in until we find a way to call the police. Now the truth is, if they were paying attention to the items in his luggage, it's already clear that Greg isn't the killer. This here is what's known as a go bag, which is a portable kit of surveillance survival gear when you're in the wilderness. Looking inside, we can see that the man brought a skiing mask, a headlight, a bundle of rope, and a map of the area, which are all important items if you're stuck in the middle of a hurricane. More importantly, if he was the killer, it would have made a lot more sense for him to use his own knife instead of this giant cookery here. This weapon is impossible to conceal, and that makes it totally impractical for a sneak attack. On the other hand, he could have killed a man anywhere in the house with his own knife instead of needing to go outside where the rain could be used as evidence against him. These girls are dumber than a sack of bricks, and if I were part of the group, I would be suspicious of everyone else a lot more than Greg here. That's why the smartest decision here is to prepare drinks for everyone to stay hydrated and spike them with a bottle of Happy Fun Time pills. If I carefully manage the dosage, it would be enough to cause extreme drowsiness, poor motor control, and diminished medicine mental faculties. This would make the potential murderer as non-threatening as possible without killing them, and it gives us the upper hand over the situation until we can figure out what's really going on here. Entering the room, the group approaches the man and wakes him up, asking what he's doing here. Greg explains that he came down here earlier to work out, but then fell asleep with his earphones in. That's why he never heard them calling his name, but they don't believe his story. Confused, the man thinks they're still playing a game and starts chasing the girls around the court, when he suddenly notices one of them waving a knife and carrying his bag. Greg stops in his tracks, and his girlfriend demands to know why he brought survival gear, but he explains it was only to prepare for the hurricane. That's when they reveal that David is dead and accuse Greg of killing him. The two men had a standoff before he went upstairs, but he can't believe what he's hearing and smacks the knife out of Sophie's hand. Picking it back up, he demands that they drop their weapons and talk this out. The girls are terrified, but they all agree and put their knives down onto the floor. That's when Jordan attacks the man from behind, but he defends himself, shoving her into a wall. He walks forward to check on her when another girl jumps into his back and chokes him from from behind. Realizing that they're going to murder him, the man fights her off and runs for the knife, but just as he picks it up, B smashes a kettlebell into his head. He drops to the floor dead, and that makes two people down with five more to go. The survivors are traumatized by the sheer brutality and take a moment to catch their breaths when Alice tells them her boyfriend wasn't the killer. Frustrated, this girl argues that he was the most likely person to attack somebody since he was a veteran soldier, but Alice is shocked, revealing that he was just a veterinarian. The girl defends herself, reminding the group they know nothing about Greg and nobody else has a motive, but soon they'll see she's the most vicious person of the group. The survivors leave the basketball court trying to figure out what to do next, but Sophie decides to break her sobriety to calm herself down. 
Later, she joins the others and overhears Alice suggests her missing friend Max might be the killer, but Emma disagrees. She insists that even though the man has a crush on her, he wouldn't kill her boyfriend, and that makes Sophie here furious. The girl can't believe how self-centered she's behaving and criticizes Emma for faking her relationship. Shocked, she accuses her friend of being toxic and walks out of the room, knowing that she was telling the truth. The situation is tense, and the hurricane is getting stronger, but that's when Alice here realizes that the new girl is missing. Upstairs, B changes out of her clothes and washes the blood off of her face. She feels guilty for murdering Greg, but these girls are about to get a lot more brutal before the night is over. Okay, B here just f***ed up big time. She's gone from bringing zucchini bread for good impressions to savagely killing a veterinarian with a kettlebell. And now she's the only confirmed murderer in the entire mansion. As quick as they've been to move on, someone is going to have to take the blame for this mess. And B here has just given them all the perfect excuse to point the finger at her. Eventually, the police are going to get involved. And if we don't have a strategy to avoid these real life consequences, we might be spending the rest of our lives behind bars. Now, the good news is that we have a great opportunity to fix this problem. Because as long as the hurricane is keeping us trapped here, we have time to stage the crime scene, making sure it's telling the exact story that we want. The girls still don't know who killed David, and it's reasonable to assume the murderer is among us, but right now, there are too many loose ends. The more this gets out of our control, the more the police will think we're all suspects, and that's why if I were B here, I would suggest that we find duct tape and a garbage bag to wrap up the body before moving him outside where we found David. Then, we can plant his fingerprints on the murder weapon and stage the scene to appear like Greg was the killer. As messed up as this sounds, it's actually a win-win for the entire group because this is the only story we can tell the police that won't completely ruin our lives. In exchange for their cooperation, I'd offer to admit that I personally hit Greg in the head, but only after witnessing him attack David. Fortunately for B here, Utah is a stand your ground state, which means it has laws that give you the right to use force in self-defense as long as the attacker has a lethal weapon. We can then use the rest of the night cleaning up all evidence from inside the house and rehearse our alibi together so that nobody's version of the story is different. It's still a risky strategy, but incentive the group to cooperate protects us from anyone confessing the truth because we've turned them into co-conspirators. And if the real murderer is still alive, she'd be happy to support our version of the story when the police come to investigate. Downstairs, Sophie searches through a board game box and discovers a ping pong ball with a hidden stash of meds inside. Finding Emma, she apologizes for yelling at her earlier, but then the girl suddenly kisses her on the lips. It takes Sophie by surprise, and she scolds her friend for being a creep, but offers the stash she found as a gift. Embarrassed, the girl accepts and quickly walks away with no idea she's heading straight to her death. In another part of the house, Alice goes looking for the new girl when she hears someone screaming in the distance. Terrified, she rushes down the hall, but as she continues through the building, she suddenly trips. Getting back to her feet, the survivor realizes that she fell in Emma's dead body and screams in horror, making that three people down with four more to go. The others find her and stare, shocked that another person has been murdered so quickly. Inspecting the staircase, Jordan suggests the victim tripped and fell to her death, but her friend insists that she was pushed. They don't know what actually happened, and it makes them terrified that either the killer is still out there, or somebody here is hunting everyone down. Later, the group gathers in a room, paranoid that they could be next, when Alice decides to speak up. She suggests that the killings are happening in the same order that the players were supposed to die in the game, but Jordan here shuts her down, insisting she's getting paranoid after taking too many pills. Alice freaks out, yelling that they're all wasted, and that's when the new girl reveals she's completely sober. That makes the others suspicious, and this girl points out they barely know anything about her. B insists she's innocent, but Jordan reveals she looked her up and found no record of the girl attending the university. It's clear she's hiding something, and the group realizes that not only did she have the chance to sabotage the generator, but they also watched her murder someone in cold blood. Any one of them could be next, and the girl tries to calm them down to explain herself, but they refuse to listen. That's when Alice starts pushing her, demanding she leave, and her friend opens the door, forcing B out of the house. They don't trust her, and she tries to go back inside, but the survivors make sure all the entrances are locked. Walking back to the car, B gets inside the vehicle and looks for something to eat, when she discovers a pair of underwear that doesn't belong to either of them. Furious, she heads back to the house and tries to find a way in, when she sees someone enter a room. Taking a closer look, B recognizes that it's Jordan, and she's just found a gun. Okay, this is getting out of control. We already have another dead body, and it could mean that the killer is planning to finish everyone off. Nobody is safe, and with this in mind, getting pushed out into the rain might actually be the best thing that could happen. Someone hears a wolf in sheep's clothing, and if we're not inside the house, then our chances of surviving the night have just gone up massively. With that said, we still don't want to become the prime suspect when the night is over, because eventually, the only people that will be left alive are us and the real killer. It's worth considering they might want to keep someone alive 
alive to blame for the murders, and it means we need to identify the killer before it's too late. Be here was smart to head back to the mansion, because as we can see, most of the bottom floor has glass windows, and since the only lights are on the inside, it's a lot easier for us to observe their movements through the house. It just so happens that B caught Jordan with a gun, and this gives us the perfect opportunity to shift the power dynamics back in our favor. The truth is, we need the rest of the group on our side to avoid the killer's endgame strategy, and that's why if I were in this situation, I would have taken out my phone and snapped as many pictures as I could. This way, we can break in by smashing a window and confront the girl in front of the group. Right now, B's disadvantage is that everyone knows she lied about going to college, and it means they won't take us at our word. That's why the best way to handle this is to ask a leading question where we know Jordan will lie, and then use the photo as evidence against her. This will help us convince the group that the only reason she would keep her weapon a secret is because she plans on using it against them, and they'll be too terrified to risk keeping the girl around. If they're still not convinced, I would remind them that Jordan found the original murder weapon and picked it up to make sure she could explain why her fingerprints were on it. She's also been the most vocal member of the group to accuse others of being the killer, and this might be enough to turn everyone against her. The girl realizes Jordan might be a killer and continues looking for a way in when she discovers a doggy door. B crawls through it as fast as she can and searches for a makeshift weapon inside the house. Terrified, the others will get slaughtered. She's determined to save her girlfriend at any cost and returns to the room where the remaining survivors have gathered. B immediately tells them that Jordan has a gun and demands that the girl empty her pockets. Reluctantly, she pulls everything out and drops the items onto the floor, but there's no gun in sight. That's when Alice spots a small paper with an X on it and realizes she was the killer in the game. B accuses her of murdering the host, reminding the others she was the last person at the crime scene, but Jordan defends herself. B has already been caught in a lie about being a college student and her own girlfriend didn't even know the truth. With no other choice, the girl reveals that she dropped out of university and lost her job a week after Sophie met her. It's humiliating to admit, but the girl forgives B for lying, grateful to learn her secret. That's when Jordan walks over to the couch and picks up a gun. The others freak out as she aims it at them, frustrated that her friend hasn't been honest, and reveals that they secretly hooked up before picking up B on their way here. That means the underwear in the car belonged to Jordan, and Sophie tries to convince her it's a lie, but her childhood friend tells B to check the girl's texts. The situation is getting personal, and Sophie lashes out, exposing the fact that Jordan admitted she doesn't like their friend's podcast. It's a low blow, and upset, Alice joins in the argument, pointing out the girl's flaws, with no idea that this was her biggest mistake. Overwhelmed, Jordan pulls the trigger, shooting her friend in the leg, and the others stare in shock. The girlfriend begs her to put the weapon down, but the survivor refuses, insisting she's not the murderer. Desperate, Alice walks up and tries to wrestle the gun out of her hands, and they all gang up on the girl, fighting over the weapon until the pistol goes flying through the air. The survivors crawl across the floor and wrestle each other for the gun, when someone suddenly pulls the trigger. Shocked, everyone backs off and realizes that one of their friends has just been shot to death, making that four people down with three more to go. Okay, these girls are complete morons. First of all, if Jordan wants to insist that she isn't the murderer, then pulling out a secret gun and shooting your friend in the lake is not the most convincing way to go about it. Anytime a weapon is introduced to a group of drama-prone addicts, we should expect that it isn't going to end well, and if the girl was thinking straight, she should have kept the gun hidden for as long as possible. Revealing your secret weapon to the killer would be the dumbest thing to do, because it means you can't take them by surprise if they attack you. Whether she's the murderer or not, this girl is clearly putting the group in more danger, and that's why taking her down is the right decision. The problem is, they went about it completely the wrong way. As soon as someone manages to grab the gun, the first thing they should do is put the safety back on and remove the bullets before throwing the weapon into the fireplace. This takes it out of the picture for the killer to use, and once Jordan is disarmed, we can get the rope from Greg's go bag to bind her hands and legs. Now, it's worth pointing out that if Jordan and Alice are getting physical, the others shouldn't make things worse by joining in. The girl has already demonstrated she's willing to pull the trigger, so trying to overpower her right now is not going to be the best decision. The safer thing to do is play on everyone's fear, and that's why if I were one of these girls, I would distract them by yelling that we just saw someone outside with a knife. If Jordan's not the killer, she'll react to the news, and it will make everyone stop fighting if there's a larger threat they need to deal with. Even if it's a lie, this made-up enemy will force the girls to work together, because they'll be less focused on each other as suspects, and as long as we stay in the same room without any weapons, there won't be any more opportunities for murder. I would then tell everyone to barricade themselves into a room on the second floor where an intruder is less likely to break in. It's important to keep in mind that fear and drama are driving these girls into making terrible decisions, so as long as we can direct their fear into the right places, we can avoid any more deaths. This should make them easier to control until the power returns, and we can then try to call for help. The girls are horrified to see another friend die in front of them, and now they're the only survivors left. Acting quickly, 
Jordan grabs the weapon and aims it at the others, terrified that they might kill her now. She backs away up the staircase as the girlfriend approaches her, begging the girl to drop the gun. It's clear she doesn't want to kill Sophie, and pleads with her to stay where she is, when suddenly, B runs into the girl and pushes her over the railing, sending her falling to the floor. Looking down, the survivors check on the killer and find her body has landed on dozens of glass bottles, wounding her badly. There's no way she'll survive this, and with her last breath, she tells Bay to check Sophie's text messages before firing at the girls above, making that five people down with two more to go. They run for their lives and quickly hide in a closet, but things are tense. The survivors don't know if they can trust each other, and B confronts her girlfriend, demanding to know if she had an affair. Sophie denies it, insisting she would never do that, and reaches out to touch the girl's cheek, but she jolts away. B is terrified that her girlfriend is the real killer and runs out of the closet. Rushing through the house, she looks for somewhere to hide and quickly ducks behind a couch before her girlfriend can catch up. Sophie tries calling out to her, but she doesn't get a response. The girl walks out of the room and making sure the coast is clear, B sneaks through the house, avoiding the other survivor for the rest of the night. The next morning, she heads outside and looks around the property, scared of being caught. When Sophie suddenly hugs her from behind, the girl reveals that she found some pills and gave them to Emma, believing that it was what made her fall down the stairs. She blames herself for her friend's death, and the survivor thinks she's finally safe when B suddenly pulls out the gun. The student demands she show her the messages on her phone, and the girl reluctantly pulls it out, but just as B reaches for the device, she tosses it away. The girlfriend quickly rushes for the phone, determined to find out the truth, and drops the gun in the process. The girls begin to wrestle for control, falling into the swing pool, and when they climb back out, B finally manages to pick up the phone, but Sophie realizes that this one isn't hers. Noticing the host's dead body nearby, the girl walks over to him, unlocking the device using his face ID, and that's when she discovers something shocking. Heading back to Sophie, she shows her that the man was recording a TikTok last night, where he tried cutting the champagne bottle open, but made a fatal mistake. He was never murdered, and the girls realize that they all killed each other out of paranoia. All of a sudden, their missing friend Max arrives, and shocked by the carnage, he asks them what happened. The girls are speechless and have learned a valuable lesson. Never leave P. Davidson alone without a babysitter. But what do you think? How would you be bodies, bodies, bodies? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe. And check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.